Day one of day three, we're uh, anticipating changing a whole lot of lives and losing a whole lot of sleep over the upcoming weekend. Thank you in advance for your participation. A couple of quick announcements before we get started with uh, owning your own phone. Uh, one is we have some live concerts, and I have some details on these. Uh, the, the concert series is called Beyond the Welding Hour, and its uh, music uh, characterizes chip tunes and circuit bending, and basically this will be danceable music created on a variety of interesting devices. We have a couple of concerts going on tonight in the video temple area. So on the mezzanine area, you can see the uh, map in your program for the location of that. 11.30 p.m. going through probably till at least 2 a.m. So if you're looking for something to do on the long overnights, that is a good choice. We're doing a uh, couple of different artists tonight, a couple of different artists uh, tomorrow night, Saturday. So that's uh, Circuit Bending Concerts live performances down in the Video Temple area tonight. Also, uh, a lot of you saw the lightning talks that happened after today's uh, Dan Kaminsky keynote. We are going to do those again after tomorrow's keynote. And if you'd like to submit a lightning talk, email um, projects at hope.net, projects at hope.net, and make the subject line include um, lightning. And, uh, and we'll monitor that. You'll get a response back if your lightning talk has been, uh, been accepted. Up next, we have uh, the telecom informer himself, uh, T. Profit, talking about owning your own phone. Well, uh, thank you. It's uh, good to be back in New York City uh, for the next hope. I thought the last one was the last one, but it uh, turns out it was just the one before the next one. Um, so if you're left over from the last talk, uh, this talk, unfortunately, uh, doesn't have anything about uh, sex or dongs or phone, sex, dongs, or anything like that. Uh, it's kind of going to be a dry-ish, sort of dry history lecture on phone stuff. But if you like phones, then you're in the right place. So uh, who am I? I'm t Profit. Uh, I'm a freak. Uh, that's the kind of person that likes to play with phones. Uh, I write a column for a 2600 magazine called the Telecom Informer. Uh, so if you do read the magazine, uh, it's not online, but it's printed on dead trees and stuff. You can buy it in the back. Um, every issue, I, I have this uh, column I do in kind of a cranky persona of a nearly retired telephone employee. Obviously, uh, I'm not quite there yet myself, but uh, you know, I try to try to be faithful to that. Um, I believe technology gives people the power to change the world. I very strongly believe this, and that's a part of why we're all here. And I believe that people accomplish the most, really, when they build communities. And so this talk is as much about phones as about communities and the direction that I think that we, as a hacker culture, need to go. Uh, so there's been a really incredible revolution that's happened in my lifetime and in many of your lifetimes. Uh, it's been disrupt disruptive. It's been destabilizing. But for one, I wouldn't have it any other way. Um, and what's happened is that we, as a result of having very cheap, very available communication technology available to us, uh, by having resources like the internet available, we've been able to communicate in ways that we weren't able to before. And it's led in a very real way to actual political revolution. Uh, among them, the Orange Revolution in the Ukraine, uh, the Rose Revolution in Georgia, which uh, supplanted a very brutal dictatorship with an actual sort of mostly functional democracy and not in the Bush administration sense. Um, there's uh, been, you know, you'll hear more tomorrow about Wiki WikiLeaks and some of the things that uh, that resource has made possible. And of course, uh, incredibly disruptive, at least in terms of how we deal with content and you know, being in the publishing industry ourselves at 2600, uh, we've had to come to grips with things like BitTorrent and the internet uh, as part of this communication digital revolution. Uh, so um, it hasn't always been this way. And if uh, government uh, telecoms and Sarah Palin have their way, it might not always be this way. Uh, so what we're going to get to is a little bit of, you know, a rewind. And I'll be talking uh, about what things were like kind of when I was a kid. There's a big period in the middle that we're going to skip over because it's uh, kind of a lost decade, I think. And then we'll get to now and a call to action as to where I think we need to go. Um, so 25 years ago, roughly, you could communicate with virtual anonymity 
in a way that is not possible now. And here's what I mean by that. Um, when you made phone calls, there weren't things like class features. Uh, and a class feature is things like caller ID and call waiting and voicemail. Uh, there was no communications assistance for Law Enforcement Act. So if the government wanted to tap your phone or monitor your movements, it was actually, from a technology perspective, a very difficult thing to accomplish. Uh, they had to do real work, send somebody somewhere uh, to clip into the frame and you know, have a reel-to-reel have a -reel recorder going. Um, some areas even still used analog switches, including Seattle, where I grew up. When I was a little kid, I, I would call the Seattle Public Library storyline, and uh, you know, I would hear the unusual clicking and ringing and wonder what that was. And you know, it was later uh, when I got toward the end of elementary school into middle school that I really learned what uh, what those switches were and started to hear them go away. And in 1984, the bell system was broken up. But one of the things that we uh, really uh, don't pay as much attention to as perhaps we should is at that time, there were a lot of independent phone companies. And they did innovate in interesting ways. Uh, you had, um, in Oregon, a number of telephone cooperatives that were community owned. And they were actually way out in front of uh, the bell companies in terms of the features that were available to their customers. And of course, there were other things going on in other parts of the world, uh, France in particular, with their groundbreaking Minitel, which in many ways is uh, kind of the predecessor to what we now know as the uh, internet. Uh, so there was an evolution. And uh, that evolution was pretty significant. Uh, I think probably the most groundbreaking thing that happened uh, was in the late 80s, uh, Sprint built the first nationwide fiber optic network. And so for the first time, it was possible over the same glass in the ground to merge voice data and video all over one network. Uh, we began to see, uh, over the years, analog switches retired and replaced with digital, uh, as I mentioned before. Uh, and also, as I mentioned before, class features were added in. But that became more or less universal. Uh, party lines, which in some of the independents in the rural areas were still commonplace, uh, even as late as the early 90s, uh, began to be retired. Uh, we saw touch tone service added, uh, first as an extra cost service, uh, and then standard. Uh, we saw voice messaging, and we saw Centrix uh, become available. And we began to see some long distance competition. And all of you know that any time we have something new available, that's a lot of new things for freaks and hackers to start trying to figure out how to take apart and use in different ways. And so. This gets us into the 1990s, which I think were the most disruptively innovative decade in human communications, really since the invention of the telephone. We saw equal access, and we saw competitive local exchange carriers. So what this meant was instead of only using AT&T for your local and long distance, um, and you know, AT&T sold itself as Pacific Northwest Bell and Bell South and, and other uh, regional Bell operating companies post the 1984 divestiture. But really, it was effectively one network still, even though there were different corporate management structures. Uh, when we got onto the, in, into the long distance space, there was a further breakup. And AT&T had to allow competition uh, for long distance. So we saw companies like MCI, companies like Allnet, uh, companies like Sprint become available not just through dial around services, but actually you could pre-subscribe your home telephone uh, to an alternate long distance carrier. We began to see with uh, the explosion of personal computers an interest in BBSs. And like Minitel in France, BBSs in the US and much of the rest of the world became, to some degree, the predecessor of what we now consider the internet. Uh, 2600 Magazine was really at the forefront of this curve and uh, had a service called the 2600 Voice BBS. Uh, the 2600 Voice BBS was particularly interesting because you didn't even need a computer to call. Anybody with a telephone could. Anybody with a payphone and a toll fraud device called a red box could. And so what you really ended up with was this amazing equalizing factor on the 2600 voice PBS. There's a, a guy who would call in um, who 
was developmentally disabled, didn't own a computer, was from a poor family in uh, upstate New York uh, named Mega Elite. One of the best freaks that I've ever talked to or dealt with. Uh, he was fantastic with social engineering. He knew a tremendous amount about how the phone system worked in the background, who to call uh, to accomplish things. And this is somebody who most people would look at as uh, retarded, uh, let's be frank. Um, a service like the 2600 Voice BBS really allowed even somebody who nobody would take seriously the ability to communicate with other like-minded people. Uh, we had coughs, and I gave a talk a couple of years ago um, called Freaks, Coughs, and Jail. Uh, I think it was here. Um, so it's online. Feel free to refer to that if you want to, a more in-depth look at the cough scene. But this, I really think, was a very important part of freaking culture, and it even remains today to be a fairly important part of freaking culture. And this gets to the community piece, which I'll get into later. Uh, it was possible to perform newly elaborate prank calls. It turns out that if you have all of these services that you can break into, like voicemail boxes, for example, um, and people trust those services, which they perhaps shouldn't, it became very easy to convince people to do things that they shouldn't necessarily do. And the more things change, the more they stay the same. And so we'll get to that later. And in the 1990s, one of the other disruptively innovative uh, things that happened uh, was on the government and regulatory side. And this actually was the predecessor to what we see uh, a lot of governments around the world, um, no matter whether democracies or not, uh, uh, trying to do in terms of controlling content. CALEA was the foundation of the infrastructure to control communications and it handed the government that control. The Communications for Assistance for Law Enforcement Act, and if you go to askcalea.com, uh, uh, that's run by the FBI. It's a site for carriers to uh, understand how to implement um, this law. There is literally a backdoor built into every telecommunications network that offers public telecommunications services in the United States. This backdoor is built in fundamentally in the background. The government doesn't actually have to do any work to tap your phone anymore. They can do it all remotely uh, through a remote monitoring uh, in dial. They just dial up a voicemail box, enter a PIN, and they can enter the number they want to monitor and listen to what you are saying. And it goes even a step, step further than that now because with wireless communication networks, all you have to do to track the location of somebody, if you're law enforcement, the physical location of anybody, even sitting in this room, is log onto a web page. And the true extent of this came out recently when uh, it was discovered that Sprint had responded to literally over 100,000 requests for location data. Uh, and provided this uh, on their website to law enforcement. This is infrastructure that's been implemented now. It is monitoring everybody potentially now. And the accountability is very limited because in the Bush administration, this dramatically got expanded. So there's been an evolution. Uh, and there was also an evolution in the ways that hackers uh, begin to look at telecommunications networks and use them. So we had things like BBSs, but if you wanted to call a BBS outside of your local calling area, and it was all through dial-up at the time, you would need to make a long-distance call. Obviously, this could be quite expensive. Uh, I don't know uh, how many of you were around then, but just a quick show of hands, who's ever gotten a long-distance bill more than $100? Okay, so older audience, obviously, um, you know, for those of you uh, who are younger, probably you'd be shocked that there wasn't such a thing as unlimited free long distance from your landline that just came standard. Um, it used to be you paid by the minute, and you could pay an awful lot by the minute. Um, so we as freaks would look at ways to get around uh, how, it how, uh, how we would have to pay so much uh, for these calls. And you know, calling cops, similar story. So blue boxes get a lot of press. And blue boxes toward the end of the 80s and the beginning of the 90s weren't in as 
broad use as they were in the 70s um, and early 80s, but you could still use them on C5 networks. And what that was is if you could get, if you could hit a route that would go over a satellite and it didn't cost you anything, you know, this is a thumbnail sketch, it's really more complicated than this, but if you could make a free call that hit a satellite in some way and that satellite used C5 signaling, it was relatively easy then to seize a trunk and go out from the other end. And so it was fairly popular to do this from uh, you know, certain countries in Asia and in Israel until they upgraded to a fiber optic link. Um, but that wasn't very practical for calling BBSs because you'd get so much line noise uh, you know, transiting through an international location. Uh, you know, there was no error correction at the time that really it was only useful for voice and even then only if a delay was acceptable. Uh, so around the time that I started getting active, the preferred way to commit toll fraud was codes. And the, it, codes was written, you know, in code, uh, K0D3Z or something along those lines. And what a code was, was either a, an open D support on a PBX that maybe you found by scanning, or it was a stolen credit card, or a stolen calling card, or sometimes uh, long distance companies would use, they'd give you a discount if you didn't use equal access, if you dialed a local number and entered a code and then dialed the number that you wanted to call, um, you could get a cheaper rate if you did it that way. So if that were to leak, um, well, you know, maybe it could be useful to freaks. And then there was this entire where scene. There's a where scene today. Uh, where's being pirated software if you're not in that scene. And remember back at the time, we didn't have the internet. So to move these things across the country, somebody had to call long distance for, you know, to the next city over BBS to BBS. And these guys were called where's couriers. And where's couriers were always looking for codes because they didn't want to pay the long distance bill to upload all the where's. Uh, so if you were a freak, you could have all the where's you wanted really just by supplying where's couriers with code. And this is something that was common. So in addition to just outright stealing other people's information, you know, some freaks were more ethical than others. And um, I would put myself in this category at the time, and you know, hopefully the statute of limitations is up, uh, having been, you know, 20 some odd years ago at this point. But um, I thought I thought at the time that if somebody got a bill as a result of something I did, then I wasn't being a very good freak. I wasn't being very good from the perspective of number one, somebody getting a horrible bill that I ran up was probably going to be pretty mad, and the phone company involved would probably be pretty mad as well. And also, you know, these things didn't tend to last very long. So uh, what many freaks would try to do is we'd obtain service in a way that it would only generate phone uh, billing internally to a phone company. Uh, or it would be just an outright subscription fraud. Uh, so there would never be a real bill that went to a real person. Um, so. One example of something that wasn't that uh, was, you know, identity theft is a very common thing today. And, you know, it tends to be drug addicts that are doing it now because it's a relatively easy thing to do. But, you know, 10 years before that became commonplace, freaks were committing identity theft of corporations. Um, and so one such number was 1-800-JAIL-BOND. That got routed to a, a, a conf. And what that was was an attachment to an existing account. So some company had a very large account with a lot of 800 numbers. And a phone call went in uh, to the telephone company serving them, uh, ordered a new number to be added to that same bulk account. And you know, just like that, uh, a new number was nailed up to a conf. And this was, you know, that's, that's a, one of the more memorable numbers, but there were lots and lots and lots of these things that happened. Um, another example of a subscription fraud, how many of you would take an order from a company called Scam Modeling? No, nobody? Um, well, with a name like that, how could you go wrong? Uh, unfortunately for Sprint, uh, they did accept an order from a company called Scam Modeling. Um, yeah, there's a certain freak that wasn't me that set this up. I, I'd never do anything that obvious. But um, 
Anyhow, uh, the, the, the story apparently went uh, that scam modeling had a whole bunch of Russian models that frequently needed to call home to Russia. And so they needed calling cards to do this. And you know, because they'd be traveling all over the place, the bill might not be paid exactly on time. And so you know, the cards would need to stay on for long periods in between billing. And somehow, you know, the person that set this up managed to negotiate 10 calling cards being sent uh, for a large, large number of, you know, thousands of dollars worth of calls uh, to Russia. Um, and the bill just never being paid. And eventually, a few months later, Sprint caught on um, <laughs> and shut down scam modeling. But um, for whatever reason, they accepted the the order. It's uh, I don't get it. But uh, this is, these are some these are some methods that freaks would use to get around billing. And you know the the real point here is that until the internet came along and really became popular people still found ways to communicate, and they still found ways to communicate for free. And things happen as a result of free communication that are pretty important. And again, the internet is not something that you just dump something on. It's not a big truck. It's, it's a series of tubes. So. Along came uh, the internet, and there was sometimes a bit of muddled understanding from certain Alaskan politicians like Ted Stevens, um, uh, understanding what the potential was. Uh, it's not like a truck, but um, OK, so this is the one thing that sort of parallels the previous talk. Uh, porn companies really had no, understand, no trouble at all understanding the potential of the internet. And so when you look at any technology that gets driven, um, and it happens to be around media, if the porn industry isn't behind it, typically it doesn't happen. So we begin to see a lot of streaming video. And really, uh, what got us from dial-up, I think, to broadband is streaming porn. Uh, suddenly, uh, free instant worldwide communication became possible, and uh, a guy named Bernie Eppers uh, envisioned integrated voice data and video. And Bernie is a really interesting story. He uh, started a company called WorldCom. He had this vision of voice data video actually being uh, an integrated service that he'd offer, and he literally went and made a whole bunch of acquisitions uh, in order to put a company together that would do this. There was only one problem, and that was in order to make the acquisitions, he committed massive accounting fraud, um, and he, you know that resulted in uh, in Mr. Ebers landing in a, a federal penitentiary where he still is. But the vision was good and real, and it actually is you know uh, where we s sort of more or less are today. Where if you look at something like the Comcast Triple Play, for example, you can get an integrated voice, data, and video package all from one provider. Uh, Bernie Ebers saw that 10 years before you could buy it. And it's really because of groundbreaking pioneering work by people like him uh, that we are able to enjoy some of the services that we are today. Um, I think of 2000 to 2010 largely as a lost decade. And so that's why I haven't focused a great deal in this talk on uh, anything except you know 1990 to 2000 and then where we are today. Um, the tech crash caused a, a serious pullback in innovation. Around 1999, things got very frothy. Um, we saw a very large amount of investment in companies that should never have been started, uh, selling products that uh, shouldn't have existed. Um, and you know, we all saw the logical conclusion of the pullback was more severe than it should have been, and so. The amount of innovation that I think that we've seen really in the last 10 years hasn't been too substantial. It's mostly been evolutionary, uh, except for surveillance. And we've built this crazy massive surveillance infrastructure without really even thinking through uh, what the social implications or the long-term implications are of this radical societal shift that's happened. Um, but there were some things that happened. We do now have a GSM deployment in North America, uh, and it more or less uh, covers the majority of the population. We didn't have this before. Uh, we saw AMPS retired. 
uh, toward the end of uh, the lost decade. Uh, AMPS was the, the old an crackly analog cellular network. Uh, we no longer have that. Uh, we saw growth in VoIP services, but the interesting thing with VoIP, if you'd asked me three years ago what the most exciting, groundbreaking, trend-setting thing would be in telecommunications uh, you know, in, the, in that decade, I would say VoIP. And the reason why was there was a lot of really exciting things happening around VoIP. Uh, it was possible for us as geeks and tinkerers to get access to some very, very, very cheap uh, VoIP services. And even today, there's things like Magic Jack, where you can call anywhere in the country for basically for free with certain limitations. And I did write a column on Magic Jack a few issues back. Um, and I believe the back issue is for sale. So if you're interested uh, in you know, some Magic Jack tricks and a little more information on that product, uh, feel free to pick up the issue. But if you'd asked me a few years ago, I would have thought that that's the direction we all would have been going. And I, th I would have thought that probably that would be um, the most exciting thing. Today, I don't think so. Because really what's happened with VoIP is what we used to do on circuit switch networks on the back end is now being done with VoIP on the back end, but it's all been transparent to you and me as consumers. And the billing hasn't changed. It's gotten cheaper for carriers to provide the service, but they're still billing you the same or more. Uh, it's kind of funny how that works. Um, so there's been growth in VoIP. It's exciting. It allows us to make better use of the existing infrastructure we have now. But we haven't really grown that infrastructure in the last 10 years uh, at a real level beyond incremental. Uh, there's been broadband adoption at a pretty wide scale. Uh, we're now seeing uh, most, the majority of people who have internet access in the US now have broadband. But it's fairly small in terms of majority. Uh, it's something like 64% the last set of numbers I saw. Uh, this tremendously lags behind other developed companies like, uh, pardon me, other developed countries uh, like South Korea, uh, where broadband adoption runs in the 90s. And we've seen a lot of, you know, anybody who has an iPhone knows that there's been a lot of new and creative ways to bill for the exact same service you've been enjoying. Um, and those creative ways always seem to be more expensive. But we haven't seen a tremendous amount, really, of at the, at the network level, fundamentally, of innovation in really since 2001 to today. So um, where we are, though, is this interesting place where it's possible now to communicate virtually anywhere in the world for little or nothing. And that is a Pandora's box. Governments want to control online speech and content. And you know, if you believe there's a First Amendment that's still meaningful, um, I have a bridge over there to, over there to sell you. Uh, the United States government is just as guilty of governments that are more overt in these efforts. Uh, it's just behind the scenes. Uh, for example, uh, there is a strong desire in the cybersecurity community within the United States federal government for what they call a kill switch, where somebody in Washington, D.C. decides to flip a switch and we don't have internet access anymore in the United States. And we've already built this in to the telephone system with Kalia. It's possible to kill telephone communications. It's not, ne not yet possible because there isn't yet code in, uh, in the routers that are the core routers of our internet infrastructure to do this. But one regulatory change, and we have an internet kill switch, and the United States has that, and any time they say that they need to stop terrorism or political dissent that could be terrorism, uh, somebody in Washington could anonymously decide to flip the kill switch. Uh, even in the US, uh, if you want to look at a more real and current example and get a some people might call conspiracy theories. YouTube is frequently censored. We have internet censorship today in the US with DMCA takedown notices. Uh, carriers want to slow innovation that they can't control by defeating net neutrality initiatives. And this is a very important debate that's happening right now. Um, should carriers be able 
uh, to prioritize some traffic over others or charge you more for certain types of traffic than other types of traffic, uh, thereby discouraging innovation in a particular direction. Um, many people like me believe that carriers should treat all traffic equally. Uh, a common carrier should be just that. Uh, other uh, people, largely with companies like Comcast and AT&T, uh, believe that they should be able to control content that traverses their networks and thereby uh, slow innovation that they can't figure out a way to bill you extra for um, or control. And innovation chokehold, I think, is an American competitiveness issue. Now, I don't normally stand up on stage and wave the patriotic flag and, uh, and wear a red, white, and blue bikini, um, but we do, most of us, live in the free world and the United States. Uh, you know, we're from all over the world, obviously. I would say the, the audience here is majority American. And believe me, South Korea isn't standing still. Japan isn't standing still. Companies, uh, countries that we compete with are not standing still. And so if we allow American corporations to decide what our policy is going to be as a nation, uh, and they're allowed to decide this in the best interest of next quarter's earnings, what happens is the long-term investments that need to be made may not actually be made to keep America competitive in this space. So I normally don't encourage many people to become politically active. Um, I think that sometimes it does more harm than good, but this is a mainstream issue. And if you feel like this Pandora's box should not be closed, then please make your uh, views known to your representatives and senators. There are two exceptions to the lost decade. Uh, you know, there, there were things that happened um, that I think were actually disruptive and I think actually uh, do open a lot of interesting possibilities. Uh, the first is social networking. And that actually now, because emails become so useless and choked with spam, for many people has become the default way to interact with friends and sometimes even family. And smartphones uh, really began to take off. And so um, let's have a little fun. Uh, quick show of hands, who in this room has a smartphone? And by that, I define a BlackBerry, an Android device, or an iPhone. OK. so. I think there were maybe four people that don't. Um, so leave your hands up. Leave your hands OK, because I want to see where, where this goes. Uh, and if we've got anybody here with a camera, like I'd like to watch, you know, I'd like to see a video of this later, because it's hard for me to see from the stage. Um, leave your hand up if you know exactly how that phone works. OK. I'm taking mine down because I don't. Um, do you completely trust AT&T and Apple if you have an iPhone? <laughs> no? Uh, OK. Um, do you trust the vendor of every application that you have installed on your phone, such as Google or Facebook or MySpace or any of those things? Or does anybody have iFart, like that thing where you press the button and your iPhone farts? Like, do you trust that guy? Uh, I don't know. OK, so, so we've got, so we still got a couple hands up. Uh, do you trust that caller ID is reliable? No? Uh, does anybody do any SMS banking? Do you trust SMS? Um, OK, is, if anybody's hand is still up, would you trust me with your phone? OK, so if you trust me with your phone, uh, bring it up here. I'll have it back to you in a couple of days. Um, but I think that that's, uh, you know, if it's gone the direction that, you know, at least from the front that I can see, that's a pretty powerful exercise, right? We have these computers in our pockets, and we don't know how they work. And we don't trust who wrote the software that runs on them. And we don't trust the network that they're using. And we don't necessarily even trust the calls that are coming in, um, that they're really from who we think they are. And we don't necessarily need you know, trust uh, that the SMSs that we're getting are real. And so you know, there's some really interesting things here. Um, and you know, I'd kind of like to, to run through uh, a couple of scenarios. Um, so 
SMS is a really interesting uh, is a really interesting piece. Um, so, who here uses text messages frequently? And that would probably be the majority of you. I know for myself, I text more than I talk now. And do you know where your SMS messages actually go when you send them? Are there copies of them anywhere? Um, is there a privacy policy associated? And you know, I'm asking these rhetorically. We can get into you know into this a little more in Q and A. But um, my friend Broker, who's here in the audience, and myself, uh, you know, we actually went through an, an exercise uh, a few months ago where we tried to figure out just based on what SMS volumes are that are public, how much storage it would take, because kind of one of the things that I do professionally is I deal with large scale storage. How much storage it would take to just archive every SMS message that's sent you know, to, from, or through the United States um, in, on any given day. Um, and you know, it's a trivial amount of storage, particularly if you're using a technology like deduplication. Now, I don't have any reason to believe that things are being archived when they shouldn't be or that anybody in particular is doing it. Um, but do you know that that's not the case? And have you ever sent anything in SMS that maybe you wouldn't want uh, you know, posted to uh, a Twitter feed somewhere? Um, and so, you know, this is, a, this is an interesting question. And I, I really just, you know, the, I'm bringing this up not to make you especially paranoid, although I probably should make you paranoid by pointing out that um, some of the surveillance infrastructure that's been implemented uh, does allow the government to track your GPS coordinates at any given time, even if your phone's off. And some phones uh, are able to turn themselves on and listen to what's going on around them uh, when the, the appropriate command is sent to them. Um, and, you know, all of this, the government or somebody uh, using these commands who shouldn't uh, <laughs> um, would, have to, would have to do. But, uh, you know, the technology is built in to, uh, to your device. And there aren't people really looking at these things and seeing whether they're secure and seeing whether they're really uh, being used the way that they should. And there doesn't seem to be a lot of accountability for things like national security letters, uh, which can activate all this technology. So in the name of stopping terrorism, world governments have created a massive surveillance infrastructure, the likes of which have never really existed in human history. But in the name of being more popular, you have probably given even more personal information to Facebook and Google. And your privacy really is for sale when you use social networks. You are not a customer of Facebook, Google, or Twitter. You are the product that they sell to their customers. And if you feel like deleting your account after all this, well, don't bother because they still own your data. Have any of you actually read the privacy policy for Facebook if you're a Facebook user? Okay, which one is, the, is what I would ask because it changes every other week roughly. And this is part of the danger with uh, trusting privacy policies to actually secure our privacy. When the interests of services you use are opposed to your own interests, and when the operator of the service can change the privacy policy anytime they like, effectively all your base are belong to them. <laughs> so your freedom really is at risk, and this actually has gotten fairly serious. You know, what if this guy on the screen were one of your Facebook friends and decided that you were probably a terrorist? Um, that could end very badly for you. It ended very badly for somebody uh, recently. Um, now, I don't know whether the guy that's alleged to be a terrorist is or isn't. I don't have that information. Um, all I can look at is, well, there were some social networks involved. There were some lax privacy policies in place. There were some trust relationships that maybe shouldn't have been there that were there. And what that resulted in is somebody sitting in jail right now. And you know whether or not he belongs there, um, I'm not really uh, qualified to comment, but what I can comment on is that if all of these tools weren't there, and if they weren't being blindly trusted uh, in ways that shouldn't be, then maybe that sequence of events would have uh, not happened the same way that it did. Uh, so here's a call to action, and uh, really why we're all here 
is this is a social event. We're coming together as hackers to bounce ideas off each other. We're coming together to learn things that we don't already know and share things that we do know uh, that other people might be able to drive even further. We're more connected than we've ever been before, and we're less connected than we've ever been before. Online communities are useful. But they're really no substitute for direct human interaction. So much more happens when we come together in communities like 2600 meetings, uh, like Metrics Create Space in Seattle, uh, or like uh, conferences such as HOPE or DEF CON. Um, with the rapid advances in smartphones and social media, we're inventing new technologies at a faster pace than any time since the 1990s. And this has really gotten out of hand. I mean, we have a different, you know, iPhone application every hour, practically. Uh, Android applications are ramping up. We're going to be having a new smartphone platform launch that I expect will get popular. Um, these technologies, though, I think are largely not secure. And they put way too much personal data in the hands of corporations. Uh, you guys need to be taking this stuff apart. You guys need to be showing the world that, uh, you know, did you know in your phone that your GPS coordinates are readily available and could be misused? People taking this stuff apart is what's going to make the technology better. And the last piece is really think through the social implications when you're either inventing or consuming new technologies. Um, there could be additional dimensions that in the focus to get a product out the door, you don't necessarily consider. And we are innovating at a very rapid pace. Uh, so I understand that it's necessary sometimes to be first to market with a product. But when you do that, if you haven't thought through uh, what the implications really could be, you know, two or three degrees out, then possibly it could come back to, bat to, to bite you. And uh, so, with that, um, I'll open up the floor to questions. Uh, just one piece, uh, I live in Beijing, so any discussion of uh, China or China, Chinese government policy in any of these areas, uh, unfortunately, I can't address. Uh, but anything else, uh, particularly the US or anywhere else in the world, is fair game. So uh, I'd love to hear any questions you may have. And thank you for being such an awesome audience. There's uh, yeah, so there are some microphones in the aisleways. Uh, so if you line up at the mics, um, I'm sure the there's yeah, there's some up in the front as well, I guess. I can't really see, you know, I got these bright lights in my eyes, so uh, maybe if the people with the Hope this on? Security Goon, yeah, there we go. Whoever asked, is this on? It's on. I got an infrastructure question. Yeah, yeah, what's up? How much fiber is still dark? How much fiber is still dark? That's a great question. So um, fiber optic cable, when it gets laid, basically has inside of it a number of strands. And so in order, laying fiber isn't a very interesting thing to do. I mean, you dig a trench and you drop the cable in it and it's, you know, a few dollars a foot. Um, what's the hard part is getting that fiber, what we call lit in the telecommunications industry. And that's where you have a whole bunch of equipment that's very expensive um, that pulls data along that fiber. And it uses uh, a technology, the most popular one currently is called DWDM. So typically what will happen is a carrier that's laying a fiber optic network, they won't necessarily, you know, this technology can be changed out relatively easily with line cards. Um, so as we come up with new and better ways to transfer data faster, uh, you just pull out, uh, you know, every couple of uh, miles, uh, one card and drop another in. And, you know, this can be done in, in a redundant way. But there's so much fiber in the ground that isn't lit because typically what you're only doing is lighting one strand in a cable and you may be leasing other strands to other companies. So there's a tremendous amount of dark fiber. Uh, dark fiber though isn't a very useful thing. Uh, you can't do much with it. You can run some, you know, we've got technology where you can run some metropolitan area networks at relatively low speed without lighting it up. but until we come up with a way to use dark fiber across uh, long distances without this very expensive equipment, uh, it doesn't do a whole lot of good. 
You didn't answer my question. Yeah, your question, so the question is, so for every mile of fiber that we have, and for, you know, it's, it's like basically you've got to have, you, you need to know for each, um, each trunk how many carriers are using that fiber strand. So some companies don't actually lease any fiber uh, to other companies. Some do. Uh, it's all proprietary information internally. So all I can do is conjecture, but I can say on an average cable, I'd be surprised if more than 10% of it is let. The end of the 90s, it was uh, something like 97% was dark, and all that is potential infrastructure. That's bandwidth waiting to be used that isn't being used. Well, it's potential infrastructure, but keep in mind, so you've, if you light up fiber, you can change out that technology with, technolo with newer technology that is able to move data at faster rates along the same fiber strand. And so part of the incremental innovation that's happened between 2000 and now is we've gone to faster speeds on the existing fiber that we already have. So I don't see that incremental approach changing. We're not going to see ginormous deployments of lighting up dark fiber. I mean, it costs billions of dollars to do that. So what I'm guessing will, and we already have more bandwidth on the backbones than we really can use. I mean, the problem, the bandwidth problem that we're having currently is how do you get at that last mile? And that's been the problem for the last 15 years. I can say that I run a 2.4, well, uh, at, at work, um, now I can't get into too much detail of what I do at work, but I, I, I can say that we have uh, some backbone networks at work that are grossly underutilized and it's largely, um, it's not that we can't throw data at other carriers, it's that they can't accept it quickly enough. This question is mostly semantic, but I think it's kind of important when discussing these issues. You referred to um, companies sending DMCA takedown notices to YouTube as censorship. Does one company telling another company, threatening them with legal action constitute censorship, or would you say it's something, I've, some would argue it's something that comes specifically from the government that? I believe that it's censorship. Um, so you have content, and that content is taken down, and it's taken down through a legal mechanism. So that, to me, is censorship. Uh, you can, reasonable people can disagree on this, right? Um, I have, this is my personal belief. I was wondering what your thoughts were on Moxie Marlin Spike's work with uh, Android applications for secure text messaging and phone calls. I think it's uh, Red Phone and um, Text Secure. I, I forget the name of the other one. I haven't seen it, but I'd love to. Uh, send okay. it to me. Sure. I have a question on um, sort of what, what are your thoughts on the, I can't remember the name. Colloquially, it's called the Truth and Caller ID Bill. Oh, what the Truth you, and Caller ID what, Bill. Yeah, what do you think about that? What, do you, what are your thoughts? So what would be the benefits or disadvantages of requiring that caller ID is legitimized somehow from its source? So let's talk about this a little bit because that's a really interesting topic. Um, you know, living in China right now, when I call somebody from my Chinese cell phone, usually the number comes up unavailable. And apparently the majority of people that I call, um, and this may or may not be, uh, you know, representative of people overall, it's just, you know, my group of friends, believe that when the phone says unavailable and there isn't a number that pops up, it's a monster calling. And they don't answer. Um, so, you know, caller ID is one of those things that isn't especially reliable anyway. We haven't even really figured out, you know, how to make it work across international boundaries yet. In some cases, even, you know, within the United States, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't work very well. Um, so a truth in caller ID bill, um, that's, that's, it's going to be difficult to enforce because what has to be proven uh, in the legislation as it's written now is that you intentionally obfuscated your caller ID somehow uh, and that you did it with malicious uh, intent. Um, so one of the other interesting problems with caller ID is that 
if you pass a law in the United States, well, the phone system is global. And so what I would expect to happen is that the malicious people that are doing malicious caller ID things would just move outside of the boundaries of the United States. And then what do you do to enforce the law against somebody who isn't particularly known? Because with the world of VoIP, it gets very interesting. I mean, it becomes very difficult to see where calls are actually coming from and who's sending them. Um, we've opened, we've let the genie out of the bottle on SS7. And, you know, when some sleazy VoIP provider in Romania has the same access to the SS7 networks as Verizon, then you really aren't safe anywhere. Uh, so don't trust caller ID is the bottom line. And if there's a law that gets passed, you totally know laws are always effective when they get passed, right? <laughs> Super presentation. Uh, you talked about uh, government monitoring phone calls, but there, uh, cell phone spyware is a very scary thing, and it can be downloaded. And if I put it on your phone, I can track your movements. I can watch, um, uh, listen to your phone calls. I can turn on the uh, microphone to listen to your room tele uh, telephone calls. It's not getting the media attention that I think it probably deserves. Why you know, it sure would. If Sarah Palin downloaded cell phone spyware, or better yet, if Bristol Palin did, and uh, you know, I think Fox News would be all over that. So, and that's really part of the call to action, right? We have these devices that have tr ridiculous security flaws, and anybody who really knows anything in this area is well aware of this. Um, there are APIs that uh, leave large swaths of things that should never be open open, and Really, what we're not seeing is these platforms. Well, you know, there's an attack surface that's as big as Goatsy, and nobody's really doing much with it. Please, somebody attack Sarah Palin or Bristol Palin. Uh, let's let's not call for attacks on specific people. Um, I don't want to be hauled off of here in handcuffs, but uh, uh, what I what I would say is that um, really as as hackers, as freaks, as security people, we need to be looking at this stuff and we need to be talking about this stuff with people that don't know as much as we do. Hi, um, in my phone, I have a setting that says um, like don't send identification and when I call somebody, it'll show up as a no number. Is that actually something in my phone that's preventing my phone number from being sent out or is that done by the provider? So what you have is a GSM phone, presumably. Yes. And what you're doing is you're setting a flag. It's, it's a G GSM feature where you can instruct the GSM network not to send your caller ID. That can be honored or not. Uh, and it isn't controlled by your phone. It's your phone's just the interface through which you can select that. Uh, if you have a... Um, if you have a CDMA phone, if you dial star six seven, you can selectively block your caller ID, or you can have your carrier block it for every call. Okay, thank you. Hello there. Uh, going back to uh, infrastructure and community for a second, um, I'm curious your thoughts on what we can do as people and liberate ourselves from these corporations and actually build our own phone networks, either wireless or otherwise. So the scope of my talk um, really is a call to action, but it isn't a call to any specific action. And I have to leave things open-ended. Um, I don't know how all this is going to shake out. I don't know three years from now how this is going to look. And really, that's up to all of you. And it's up to you, if you're passionate about this issue, to look at a way where you can leverage where you're awesome and what you know and how you can inspire other people. And so really all I can do is encourage you to take that part of you that understands that part of this issue that other people don't and shed light on it. Uh, make it public, talk to other people. You're here at Hope, that's what this is for. I have time for one more question and then we have to go. When do you think routers will be a thing of the past and the internet will be wide open, CDMA or something like that? with uh, just digital signal processors everywhere? As long as we need to push packets, and as long as we're still using TCP IP, we will need routers. Uh, so I don't think that's going away anytime soon. Um, you know, what the transport is before we get to there, and I, think, I don't think we're gonna see wireless as, uh, as what we're using for our trucks. I mean, that's gonna be glass in the ground, and it's, it's gonna stay that way, at least for the foreseeable future, I think. Um, 
you know, that's, that's an interesting question, but until we get away from uh, the, using TCP IP, I don't see that happening. Okay, well, uh, you've been a fantastic audience. Thank you so much.